Hi everyone and welcome back to this lecture. In the last part of the lecture, we talked about molecular separation techniques focusing on electrophoresis and chromatography. For the next part of the lecture, we'll talk about labeling molecules, DNA mostly, in order to trace them. We've already touched on some examples of radioisotopic labeling. You can replace some atom in your molecule with a radioactive isotope to track it and you can image it by autoradiography, phosphor imaging, or you can detect it by liquid scintillation. We'll talk about the first two examples in the next few slides. There are also non-radioactive methods for labeling molecules. We'll talk about one example, chemiluminescence. For radioactively labeled tracers, if you're looking at nucleic acids, you can radioisotopically label the nucleic acid and that allows detection of very small quantities of your DNA or RNA. Radioisotopic labeling allows for very sensitive detection of DNA. Quantities of DNA less than a picogram can be measured. That's less than a trillionth of a gram. By labeling your DNA or RNA with a radioisotope, you can detect it by exposure of an x-ray film. And this could be, for example, from a gel electrophoresis. If you have radioactively labeled DNA, you could separate that by electrophoresis and then you could expose an x-ray film to the gel, develop the film, and see the DNA bands that contain radioactivity. Alternatively, you could do imaging of single molecules of DNA. Here's an example from one of your previous chapters looking at the replication of a circular bacterial genome. An autoradiograph produced from exposing an X-ray film to radioactively labeled nucleic acid can also be used for quantification of the labeled nucleic acids. You may have an X-ray film that you develop into an autoradiograph, and the amount of ionizing radiation that you exposed these films to results in darker spots developing, so you can quantify the amount of labeled molecules using a process called densitometry. Essentially, that's just measuring how dark the spots are on your autoradiograph. A densitometer measures the light that's absorbed in these autoradiographs, and that's kind of a rough way to quantify the amount of a labeled molecule that you might have. Pictured here, these researchers are comparing the darkness of bands in an autoradiograph of labeled DNA in different experimental conditions to get a sense of the amount of labeled DNA in each condition. Using a densitometer, densitometry can provide a quantitative measure. An analogous method to developing an X-ray film is to use phosphor imaging. Phosphor imaging is more accurate than densitometry. Instead of X-ray films, you use specialized plates that are called phosphor imaging plates to absorb energy of electrons from radioactive decay. And if you use a phosphoimager, which is an instrument that releases the energy in a scanning process with a laser, that energy can be measured digitally, and that's a lot more accurate than looking at autoradiograms from an X-ray film. Those are some ways of labeling and quantifying molecules with radio labeling. You can also label molecules without radioactivity. Here's an example from your textbook for using a chemical labeling method that results in chemiluminescence. In this example, we're generating a hybridization probe with chemically labeled DNA. So this DNA from which you want to make a probe, you would replicate with modified nucleotides, biotinylated nucleotides in this example. If you are going to do this with radioactive labeling, you might replicate this DNA with radioisotopically labeled nucleotides. But in this case, you use chemically modified nucleotides where a biotin group is attached to these molecules and then you can generate a probe that has biotin groups attached to it. You can use that to hybridize to a specific sequence of DNA that you might want to detect. Detection relies on the interaction of these biotin groups with a fusion protein which contains an avidin portion. Avidin and biotin bind very strongly to one another, one of the strongest non-covalent bonds found in nature. So now you have this fusion protein that has avidin bound to the biotin. And also, on this fusion protein, you have an enzyme 
and you can detect where that enzyme is because it catalyzes a chemiluminescent reaction. In this example, the enzyme here is a phosphatase, which you can use to cleave the phosphate group from a phosphorylated substrate to produce a chemiluminescent product that gives off light, which you can detect. This example uses biotinylated nucleotides to make a chemically labeled probe. You have this biotinylated nucleoside triphosphate replacing normal deoxythymidine triphosphate, DTTP, for the replication of DNA. In this case, this modified base still has the hydrogen bond acceptor and donor groups for normal base pairing, but attached is this biotin group. So what you end up with if you PCR amplify DNA with this is a double-stranded DNA molecule with normal base pairing, but extending out from these bases you have biotin, which can then interact with avidin, which is fused to some enzyme that you can use to detect where the biotinylated probe is because it produces light by turning over this substrate. That can be useful for detecting nucleic acids by blotting. Blotting techniques are some applications for nucleic acid hybridization methods. You can detect nucleic acids and proteins by blotting, either using radioactively labeled probes or chemically labeled probes. In a southern blot, you can detect DNA by hybridization to a labeled probe DNA. This was developed by Edwin Southern. In southern blotting, you do electrophoresis of your DNA sample, and then you probe with your specific DNA probe, and you'll see where it hybridizes to the target. There are other analogous methods for detecting other kinds of molecules. Kind of playing on the name of the southern blot is the northern blot. It's a similar principle, but instead of detecting DNA, you're detecting RNA. So RNA is hybridized with a labeled DNA probe. And along the same lines, you have Western blotting. This is not a method for detecting nucleic acids, but it's for detecting proteins. You can run a protein gel and detect protein by binding an antibody. The antibody might be chemically labeled so you can detect where it binds. So there are Southern, Northern, and Western blots. Is there an Eastern blot? There is an Eastern blot. We won't go into detail in this course, but it's related to the Western blot, with the exception that it's primarily used to detect post-translational modifications on proteins. These are some methods for detecting nucleic acids and proteins by blotting. Coming back to the details for carrying out a southern blot experiment, you would perform this to detect DNA that you have separated by gel electrophoresis. To detect specific sequences of DNA, you would use hybridization probes. These are DNA fragments that can anneal complementarily to your target sequence, and they are labeled in some fashion, either radioactively or non-radioactively. So here you run your DNA on a gel electrophoresis, separating DNA by size. You then transfer the DNA onto a membrane that binds DNA. This could be nitrocellulose or nylon. The membrane with transferred DNA is also called a blot. The blot can be treated to permanently fix the DNA where it has bound. Where the target DNA is fixed on the blot, you can then hybridize with your probe, your DNA fragment that you have labeled either radioisotopically or chemically. Then you can wash away the probe that has not hybridized to any of the blotted DNA. You can also improve stringency and specificity by first incubating with nonspecific, unlabeled DNA that blocks any sites where the labeled probe might nonspecifically bind. After doing this, you can detect if and where the probe has hybridized to the target DNA. You can tell if the DNA with a specific sequence is present and identify which band it corresponds to on the blot and electrophoresis. In northern blotting, you do essentially the same thing, except you're detecting RNA and not DNA. There are a number of ways you can label fragments of DNA to act as probes. One example is you could PCR amplify them either with radioisotopically labeled or chemically labeled DNTPs.
One example of how Southern blotting can be applied, shown in your text, is a technique called DNA fingerprinting. It's a pretty old technique dating back to the 1980s. This is a way to distinguish different individuals by genetic differences. As humans, we're mostly the same genetically. There's about a 0.1% difference on average between any two individuals. Out of 3 billion base pairs in your genome, this difference amounts to about 3 million base pairs. Some of these genetic differences are easily detectable. For example, microsatellite DNA. What is microsatellite DNA? These are short tandem repeats of DNA, sequences of about two to a dozen base pairs that are repeated in many different regions in the genome. The number of repeats in these different regions varies between individuals. In any position where you find these repeats, it's quite variable how many microsatellite DNA copies you will find. So to perform DNA fingerprinting, you take DNA and cut it up with a restriction enzyme, run a gel electrophoresis, and then perform southern blotting with probes that will hybridize the microsatellite DNA. The result is that you get banding patterns that are very unique to an individual. Illustrated here is an example where you have a stretch of DNA chopped up by some restriction enzyme, which results in many fragments. Some of these fragments have microsatellite DNA repeats on them. If you perform southern blotting with a probe specific for microsatellite DNA, you will only see hybridization to fragments that contain the microsatellite DNA. But since these microsatellite DNA are present in many different fragments, the blot would result in lots of bands detected for DNA from an individual, as you can see in this figure. This illustration on the left is for one individual, but if you were to compare this to another individual, you'd have different sizes of the fragments that contain the repeats on account of the different number of repeats. This results in banding patterns unique to an individual's genome. Shown on figure 5.14 are DNA fingerprints of 11 different individuals. You can see they are all different with the exception of 10 and 11, which appear to be the same. But these are different individuals. If you guessed that these are identical twins, you'd be right. They share the same genome sequence. DNA fingerprinting can give you a very complex pattern. This is because the probes for microsatellite DNA hybridize to many different fragments that result from restriction digestion. That can make the analysis a bit complicated. One way to simplify this is to reduce the number of fragments hybridized. Instead of using a probe that hybridizes to the microsatellite DNA, which is present on many fragments, you might use more specific probes that hybridize to unique sites on the genome that, for example, might be located near microsatellite DNA. So the fragments that these sites are on will vary in length between individuals, but you should see only one or a few bands for one probe. Using only a few probes will give you a few clear bands, but the patterns should still be distinct for different individuals. One example from your textbook shows how this can be used for forensic evidence. This is an example of a criminal investigation, a rape case. DNA from the perpetrator has been collected from this crime scene, from the victim's clothing and a vaginal swab, and this can be compared by DNA typing to two suspects and the victim. Because of restriction fragment length polymorphisms, the fragments from restriction digestion that are hybridized by the probes differ between individuals. This comparison can be used as evidence, which rules out one suspect and incriminates another. This is one example of southern blotting for forensic analysis. In another example, this could be used to test parentage or other familial relationships. You have here restriction fragment length polymorphisms being picked up by specific probes. These are compared between the child, the confirmed mother, and a potential father. The DNA typing from the child should show bands that each correspond to either the mother or the father. These should be from fragments of DNA on a locus that was inherited 
from the mother or the father. In this example, at this locus on a chromosome pair from the mother, you have these fragments produced which give two bands corresponding to a large fragment and a small fragment. At the same locus on the corresponding chromosome pair from the father, you have these two fragments produced giving the two bands corresponding to intermediately sized fragments. For each chromosome pair, the child inherits one chromosome from the mother and one from the father. The DNA typing will show some bands in common with the mother and some with the father. You can see in this simple example, the typing is consistent with this man being the child's father, but not so for this man. Here is another example. You see that the child shares fragment lengths in common with the mother and one of these three men, suggesting a relationship between the child and male number two, who could be the father. One last example I'll go over that applies hybridization techniques is called fluorescence in situ hybridization, or FISH. This is a method to visualize genes on chromosomes. In this example from the textbook, you have chromosomes that have been stained red using a general stain for DNA called propidium iodide. In fluorescence in situ hybridization, you might have a specific DNA probe that will hybridize to a given gene on a chromosome. If that probe is chemically labeled so that you can detect it by fluorescence, you can see specifically which of these chromosomes is the one carrying that gene by direct visualization. That's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, I will introduce DNA sequencing methods, restriction mapping, and DNA mutagenesis.